All right, everybody. So we have Dr. Brad Dieter back with us today. He has a master's in biomechanics, a PhD in exercise physiology. Welcome back, Brad. How are you, man? It's, uh, it's been a little over a year, I believe. Yeah, it has. It's, it's kind of crazy to think I've been doing it that long. Um, things are flying by. And, and we have, I've had a few people on second times. I think there are certain people that people just like to hear talk, you know, like Eric Helms is, of course, like a favorite on a lot of people. Um, I definitely enjoyed the last time we talked. And so obviously plenty has come out in the last year. So I think we'll have a good discussion here. Yeah, for sure. And um, since I do start everyone with a, like a charity donation, I know last time we did Ronald McDonald. This time you said you're going to maybe look into some other ones. So for everybody listening, we will have down below um, whatever Brad chooses where my donation will go to. So if you do like that charity yourself, look down below and feel free to make a donation. It's great that you do that. It's, uh, it's a very unique thing and it's awesome to see you give back. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's funny because a lot of people have commented on that. Um, and it is, it's cool, especially when people reach out to me and they say like, oh, that was a good cause. Or like they'll DM me and say like, I donated too. Because for some of them, I don't have any way to track it. So Operation Smile is the one that I work with more closely. Yeah. So I can actually see when people make a donation. But the other ones, I really have no idea. I just, I hope it's working. <laughs> it's yeah. what I'm going by. So um, recently, I think in the last month, the I guess vegan documentary that came out the game changers and I don't think you've seen it I haven't seen it but I've heard a lot of people talk about it that I I'd like to think I have a general idea um and so from what I understand you've got you know Arnold Schwarzenegger was on there you've had some other athletes on there and they're touting that they kind of discovered that there are these elite professionals on vegan diets and it's, it's allowing them not only just to be healthier but allegedly to perform better and to perform optimally, um, which is certainly contradictory to what we, we typically hear in, in sports nutrition. And so when we talk about vegan diets for performance, what does the data show? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's kind of a lot of layers to this. You know, one, we can talk a little bit about some of the, the actual scientific data, and then we can maybe go into, you know, some of the, the stories that we see in, in Netflix documentaries, um, and maybe even, you know, just some, some real world stories that we see. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we know about vegan diets is, I think the first comment is they're not all created equal, um, right? So basically, the idea of a vegan diet is just removing you know, animal products from it, right? And you can have a vegan diet that is 100% eating, you know, Sour Patch Kids, right? Like that's <laughs> that's technically a vegan diet. Um, and you can right. have another one that's, you know, very rich in diverse plant proteins that's supplemented with, you know, some, some smart, um, you know, essential fatty acid supplementation and you're getting enough calories and it's a well-balanced diet and it's providing enough nutrition and energy. Um, so I think the discussion has to start there of, you know, veganism is a very broad range of, of ways of eating, right? And very broad dietary patterns. So you can, you can kind of fall anywhere in that spectrum. Um, one of the things we do know is that in athletes, especially we, most of the research is, is more in endurance athletes is, and a lot of endurance athletes, people who are vegan have a higher risk of having some nutrient deficiencies. Um, one of them is, is iron, um, especially in endurance athletes, right? Endurance athletes generally, regardless of what diet they're on, have a higher risk of, of iron deficiency. Um, and you put, you know, a vegan diet on there, which is typically low in bioavailable iron. They have a, a greater risk of having iron deficiency. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have you know, vitamin B12 deficiencies, sometimes they have choline deficiencies, and sometimes they have vitamin D deficiencies. Just because of the types of foods that they eat, um, if it's not a super well-rounded diet, they just have an increased risk of some of those deficiencies. Now, not all of them will get those, but it is an increased risk. And that's pretty, um, pretty well documented throughout almost all the scientific literature. Um, but, but other than that, you know, most athletes, as long as they're getting enough caloric intake um, and their protein intake is diverse enough, you can function pretty well as a vegan athlete. Um, you know, as long as you're pretty smart about it and you kind of check all the boxes you need to, you can operate pretty well. Um, and in most people, you know, you may not even notice a difference between when they're vegan or non-vegan if it's, if it's a really well done vegan diet. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, something that I've seen, I mean, obviously in the last probably two years, you know, there was the, the carnivore diet that kind of blew up. Not that that just came out recently, but it has seemed to gain popularity. Um, so, so later we'll kind of touch on that. But for people who do want to try a vegan diet and whether it's for ethical reasons, for, you know, performance reasons, health reasons, whatever it is, you, you mentioned on some of the deficiencies that can happen. So what would be a kind of recommendation for people going that route? Where you say, okay, before you do anything, what are the boxes you have to check? Yeah, I mean, so one of the one of the first things that I always kind of coach people who are, are vegan athletes on is really understand your your protein needs as a vegan athlete, right? Um, that's a big important one. Depending on whether you're a bodybuilder or an endurance athlete, your protein intake needs will kind of um, vary a little bit. But being cognizant of the fact that when you're getting only plant-based proteins, not all of the plants have a complete amino acid profile, right? So getting a good mixture of a bunch of different vegan-based protein sources is a smart way to go about doing it, right? That doesn't mean you necessarily always have to, you know, look up all of the amino acid profiles of every food you eat all the time, but just make sure that you're not relying on the same, like you're not eating, uh, you know, brown rice for all of your protein sources, right? Or you're not eating um, just nuts for all of your protein sources, right? So getting a good variety to cover those bases and being really cognizant about that. Um, the other one, you know, is a lot of the a lot of the vitamins and minerals that you sometimes miss from a vegan diet. It's really smart to get blood work done and supplement them um, as needed, right? So uh, vitamin B12. Sometimes uh, people, you know, like we talked about. I usually typically recommend people who are athletes and they're practicing a vegan diet is either supplement with that because it's water soluble, so you mm-hmm. you won't really store more than you need to. Um, choline is something to consider supplementing with, uh, and then also, you know, vitamin D and and iron should be things that you take based on your blood work, right? So maybe every four to six months, get some blood work done and see if you need to be supplementing with those. So those are kind of some of the practical things, and then. What I tell people is approach it just like you would approach any other way of eating, right? Is make sure you're getting an adequate amount of fruits and vegetables. Your foods are coming from, you know, high quality sources and you're matching your energy needs, like your intake and your expenditure. And, but those are principles that apply to regardless of you eat meat or not. Sure. Um, So you mentioned, I, I think you mentioned that some of the, even if you are getting a certain amount of protein, or, or was it protein or maybe the minerals that aren't as bioavailable? Um, yeah. So can you kind of explain why that would be if it's a similar amount, what the problem could be? Yeah, so you know, one of the good examples is iron, right? So the iron that's found in plant-based proteins is not as readily absorbed um, and available to your body as if you're getting it from a piece of steak or chicken or fish or something like that. So if you were to eat, you know, let's say you had 100 grams of uh, an iron-containing plant source and 100 grams of an iron-containing uh, meat source, generally, you're going to absorb and use more of the iron that's available in the animal product than in the plant product. And that's just based on kind of the, the fundamental biochemistry of how that iron is locked up in the plant and then how you, how you digest it. So that's, that's one of those things. Um, and one of the things I did want to touch on a little bit is, you know, one of the... One of the interesting things about documentaries like uh, Game Changers or any of these things that kind of come out is, especially when you're talking about elite level athletes, is there's a lot of things that people just don't consider, right? Is mm-hmm. elite level athletes generally are going to be elite level athletes no matter what they do, right? Like if you look at some of the dietary patterns of some of the world's best, ath- best athletes, they're terrible. right? And it's not like, they got it's kind there. of amazing, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't get to where they are because of what they ate. They got there despite of what they ate, right? It's just mm-hmm. they are genetically gifted. They, they outworked everybody. Um, and they are just the, the 1% of the 1% of the 1%, right? So when you take that group of people and then you look at what they ate and you assume that their food was what got them there, doesn't really make any sense, right? Like... <laughs> The kind of the, the causal relationship isn't there. Um, and then the other one is sometimes a lot of people will adopt changes once they reach to a certain level, but that isn't what got them there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, 
you know, somebody who maybe ate a certain way for 40 years of their career or 30 years of their career and then switched once they reached the pinnacle of their sport, well, you can't say that that was the causal factor either, right? So a lot of times what people do doesn't always reflect of how they got there. Um, and you can see that in all sorts of analogies. Um, so that, that's another thing to kind of be, to be careful of is whenever you see elite people, uh, don't assume that everything they did was what got them there. Sometimes they got there despite of what they did. Yeah, I mean, I think that's often the case. Um, I mean, you'll see that with Olympic athletes. Like, I think for a year or two, like, like the cupping stuff was, like, super popular. And you'd see that, and people would think, oh, well, they, you know, I've got to do that for performance or um, different tapes and things that maybe haven't been proven to really do all that much. Um, but you, you think it, it's a little, I think, jarring to some people mentally because they think, well, we're ta- we always talk about how important diet is. And let's say from, like, a fat loss standpoint, diet is super important, right? So – you then assume, well, if they're the literal best of the best, you're not just saying they're good. You know, you're saying these are like some of the best people. They have to have their diet right because how else could they be performing at the top? Somebody else who, you know, like if they were doing it wrong dietarily, somebody else with similar genetics would be beating them if they had their diet on point. But I I think to your point, like when you do have that amazing of genetics, it it is really like almost everything works. and that can really skew people's ideas of what they need to do to get, I mean, I shouldn't even say to get similar results because frankly, they're not going to get <laughs> similar results regardless, yeah. but to improve, they might then, you know, get the wrong idea. Um, and you're right. You do see a lot of analogies as far as like, what do they do to get themselves there? Because I think you see that a lot in people who try to stay lean year round. Like I remember back on the like T nation forums and, and there was like a really big guy and he would always promote kind of bulking up. And I think he probably took it, too much to the extreme, but he would say, you know, you look at these guys, they're forgetting what they did to get this big. They didn't stay, you know, contest lean or even beach lean year round. They bulked up at some point to get this size. And, and I would say for the most part, that's true. Almost every, especially natural lifters, almost every natural lifter gets somewhat soft at some point to put on a lot of size. You know, they don't look like an Instagram model all the time. Um, and I, I think it is unfortunately very easy to forget that. And it's, it's not as glamorous, you know? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, a lot of people look at an end result and miss the 99% of what happened before that result. Um, And I think, I mean, you can even draw an analogy probably to your dental school, right? As people see you as as a dentist, but nobody sees everything that led to to pass your boards, right? As nobody sees all of the all the weekends that you missed stuff, all of the times that you literally were eating ramen all week because, you know, <laughs> you had to pay tuition bills and, and all sorts of stuff. And people don't see all of it that takes to get you there, right? And a lot of times people just don't make that connection. Yeah, yeah, definitely general life principle. Um, I did want to ask on the iron, um, how would iron supplements compare to the availability in plants versus meat? Do you know? Um, typically iron supplements are fairly analogous to, you know, what's available in an animal protein. Um, so, but it's, okay. it's typically a little bit more bioavailable just because there's not as much stuff with it. Um, so typically it's, you're going to get, obviously it's just straight iron. So you're going to get more of it per gram that you consume than from, from, right. uh, animal products, but it's, it kind of goes, you know, plant-based, animal-based, supplement-based in terms okay. of lowest to highest. Right. Okay. Um, just curious, do you, if for your own athletes or anybody you're kind of looking over, do you have them look at ferritin as well, or do you, you kind of just focus on iron levels? Uh, we, we kind of look, look at the whole panel. Yeah. Iron, ferritin, the whole kind of iron aspect of metabolism. Okay. Yeah. I just asked for selfish reasons because I, I just did personal blood work and yeah. my, my, they've always been kind of low for me, but my last one, my, my ferritin was like nine. And for people who don't know, the reference is like 20 to like 300. <laughs> so uh, I think I might start supplementing with iron pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, or just start eating a lot more ribeyes or something like that. Right, right. Um, which is funny, actually, because the next thing I did want to talk about carnivore diet a little bit, just because it is on the other extreme. And I, I didn't do it to do carnivore diet. I more just did an elimination type diet. And so I just started off with meats, and, and then I started adding more and more Um And so, you know, I guess you could say for a week or so, I did a carnivore diet. And I really don't know how anybody is eating 
like 5,000 calories that way or, or even like 3,000 calories. I mean, I've historically had a pretty big appetite, but man, like four pounds of red meat every day, like <laughs> for me, that was very, very tough. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's just like kind of nauseating after a while. Like it's just, you, you could eat more of something else, <laughs> but and like your jaw was more probably sore too. You were like, God, I can't chew anymore. Well, I, I actually did have to start switching to, um, to like ground beef because some of the steaks, I just, I really, I couldn't, I couldn't keep chewing anymore. It was, it was a problem. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, have you ever experimented with any, like one variation or the other, like any of these extremes or have you always been kind of balanced yourself? Um, like I've done short periods where I've just kind of tested stuff to see like more from a, um, lifestyle standpoint. So when I have clients who, who've done stuff like that, I kind of have mm. an idea. Um, but I've never done anything super prolonged. Um, okay. just because it's, I'm, I don't find the science compelling enough for me to change my life for, you know, for yeah. years at a time to do something that extreme. Um, but yeah, you know, one of the interesting aspects of, of people who are on a carnivore diet is it's very similar to how every other super restrictive diet works, right? Is right. If you just have one thing, your likelihood of eating so much of that thing that you're in a caloric surplus is pretty low, right? Like you kind of mentioned. Um, you know, the other aspects are it's, it's very high in protein, which is very satiating. And the people who are getting, you know, four or 5,000 calories a day are typically eating pretty high fat cuts of meat, right? Like they're eating a lot of ribeyes, which a lot of ribeyes are more fat than they are protein. Um, yeah. So it's, it's one of those things that's just, it's another way to control calories. Um, you know, the, the research on it is, is fairly sparse, like the actual hardcore scientific yeah. evidence, um, which at this point in the nutrition science literature, if there's something that doesn't have a lot of data on it, um, you know, typically tells you that it hasn't been super interesting to a lot of scientific researchers, right? Um, right, right. We've kind of, I mean, there's a lot of diets that we've studied pretty intensely. Um, obviously, we've we've had ketogenic diet research since I think about the 1920s or 30s. Um, yeah. We've had low fat diet research since the 1940s, 1950s. We've had you know uh, vegan diets for about that long. So the the research is pretty broad, um, and we do have some kind of you know meat heavy, low everything else diet, but it, it's never really made a huge splash of like, hey, here's a ton of scientific evidence on it. And I think mm -hmm. it's because we've got a pretty good understanding of, you know, why you wouldn't adopt that approach long term. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, that one is stranger to me than the whole vegan thing. Um, just because I can I can understand some arguments for veganism. Um, I don't really, you know, if, if that's like your moral value, then I don't think you can really argue against that. Like, I mean, you could, but I'm not really going to get involved in somebody's like moral or ethical decisions on, on their diet. Um, from a health standpoint, it's I think it's probably healthier <laughs> than a carnivore diet. Um, but I, I think that you will, like you have said, have some um, deficiencies. I don't. I feel like the carnivore diet. It's almost like they're doing it for the sake of like having something to talk about. Like it's just strange. Like how did anybody decide that I'm just like purposely not going to have anything but like red meat? Like it's just it's almost odd. Like who even came up with that? I don't know. I don't know like the origin of it or if, if you know that at all. But you know, I I actually haven't looked into it that much because um, it's just never been a topic that I've been overly interested in. I think when yeah. you kind of look at when you look at human physiology and you look at how we metabolize food and you kind of look at our, you know, how we're set up structurally is we're very clearly omnivores. Um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, there's a lot of nutrients that we need from plants for kind of optimal health. Um, yeah. you know, things like fiber, a lot of the phytonutrients, um, you know, a lot of the nutrients that are in plants are very beneficial to us as humans. And we've kind mm -hmm. of evolved for that. So, Whenever you kind of see all of the, the basic science pointing you away from something, it's I don't really get super excited about like, hey, maybe this is a really crazy hack that we haven't looked at yet. Right. Some biohack or something. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> um, I guess more on the topic of incorporating meat into your diet in general, we were talking before we started recording about that meat study, the red meat and processed meat study a few months ago. 
And as long as I can really remember that I've been involved in this stuff, it was kind of always like, you know, fish is good for you. Chicken is like kind of like more neutral. Red meat and processed meat is kind of like what you should stay away from. I mean, not like as like a hard statement, but that's kind of like what people would tout, you know, like fish Mm -hmm. is much more healthy. Um, Can you just briefly kind of go over what this uh, this new piece on meat has been saying? Yeah, so this this uh, this paper that came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, I think it was in October. Um, I think it was early October, early October, late September. And basically, what they did was they yeah. looked at all of the available research on basically red meat intake and, and health outcomes, right? And they concluded that you probably don't need to worry about your red meat intake. Um, was their conclusion, right? And I think the the reason that they drew that conclusion is the scientific evidence to date is very, it's kind of weak, right, for drawing really strong conclusions. And I think a lot of that comes down to just, one, the nature of of nutrition research, especially nutrition epidemiology, is really difficult to do really well. Um, And when you look at the, like, the really well-defined, a little bit more mechanistic studies that are available is the effect that comes out is is pretty small. Mm -hmm. Uh, and kind of the biological rationale for why red meat might cause some, you know, increased risk for bad health outcomes are not super well defined. So basically we get this picture of there's some rationale kind of loosely put together that says, you know, red meat may increase your risk for some bad health outcomes. But we don't really have a good quantification of it. Um, and we don't really know how we quantify that risk for people. So right now, we'll just say, you probably don't need to worry about it too much. Um, now, there's there's some caveats to that, and this is kind of my own personal perspective, is if we look at that information layered on top of our current kind of health climate, um, mm-hmm. it, it makes sense, right? Like, what are the big risk factors we have for for early death, for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, um, and for any of these other major chronic health conditions, right? If you kind of rank the things that actually matter, red meat intake, like the effect of red meat intake is probably 20, 30, 40 down the list, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's all the other things before you get there that matter. So any of that risk for red meat intake is probably negated by you know, just general overweightness, lack of physical activity, um, all the other potentially negative uh, nutrients that people are eating, you know, things like people have really high intakes of, uh, you know, processed fatty fats, processed carbohydrates, um, you know, all of those things are a lot more, uh, they convey a lot more risk than just the actual maybe potential components of red meat that are problematic. So you kind of get this negative effect washed out with all the other bad things that are going on in our environment. Would you apply that to processed meat as well? Like when you, people are talking about like the really processed like sausages and things like that, or would you also say that that's not a big deal? Yeah. So when we kind of look at the red meat um, literature, at least my read of it, maybe differs a little bit from that uh, that position standard, that that guideline that came out. And the one clear signal we do seem to find is that high intakes of processed meats um, convey some increased risk of major cardiovascular events and all cause mortality. Um, so we do know that that's pretty clear. Now that effect is still fairly small. And the other thing that you have to consider is typically people who consume a diet that's like really high in pepperoni and jerky sticks, right? <laughs> They're probably right. not also, you know, consuming a lot of fruits and vegetables. They're probably also not really physically active. They probably also don't carry a healthy BMI. They're probably um, more likely to smoke. They're more likely to drink. Uh, you know, they're more likely to you know, engage in other risky behaviors. So as much as you can statistically control for all that stuff, mm-hmm. um, all those behaviors tend to cluster, right? So when you see a really small effect in a pretty, what I'll say, unhealthy dietary pattern, it may just be that that pattern or that signal of processed meat is just indicative of a cluster of behaviors. So is it just that they're not able to fully control for Because I've heard other people say that, well, you have to look at what they're doing. I, I think to most people, they assume that that's what controlling for those factors means. 
Yeah, and so part of the issue is, you know, when you look at, I mean, when you do a statistical analysis that's multivariate, right, and you control for, let's say, you, let's say you're looking at the effect of processed red meat on, you know, all these outcomes, right, and you're controlling for BMI, for height, for weight, for smoking status, all those things, basically all they're doing is mathematically controlling for the error in the data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that that perfectly accounts for the biology, but it definitely does not, con you know, it's, it's a mathematical surrogate. So it doesn't actually convey all of that information. Um, right. And when you kind of run the analyses and you actually look at how, like, if you repeat the analysis and you remove just smoking, how much does it change it? You really start to see how, how variable those effect sizes are um, and how a lot of these, these healthy and unhealthy behavior patterns do cluster and how some of those effects you've got to read a little bit more into than just the number you see in a paper. Right, right. Um, this is actually something I don't think I've ever asked anybody about. Like, I think if you were to look on like a, like a Dr. John Mercola article or something like that, right, you know, they'd say avoid, you know, anything that has like GMOs. Like, you know, they start getting into like everything's got to be like 100% natural. I've heard some, you know, people who are fairly knowledgeable though say that when it comes to something like fish, like a lot of us think it's like fish is so healthy, but that when it comes to something like farm raised tilapia, something like that, that there are like legitimate issues with that based on the feed, um, you know, based on their environment. That's, that's really not something I've looked into or spoken to anybody who I really respect the opinion of. Um, I don't know if, if you have an opinion on something like that versus like a fresh caught, like wild caught Alaskan salmon or something like that compared to like a farm raised tilapia. Yeah, and so there is some truth to that, right? Um, when you look at the kind of the benefits typically of, of having a lot of, you know, fresh wild caught fish intake is typically due to their, their fatty acid profile, right? So they have a much higher ratio of omega-3 fatty acids than other foods. Um, they have a lot of um, other bioactive molecules, um, things like... Uh, like astaxanthin and some of these like more antioxidant types of, of molecules. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you look at the, the nu nutrient profiles of farm-raised fish is their omega-3s are not, you know, that profile is not as good. They have a much lower content of a lot of these other, you know, potentially beneficial nutrients that we get from wild-caught fish. So wild-caught fish definitely do have a much better nutrient profile than farm-raised fish, right? Mm -hmm. um, but should you opt for bacon over a farm-raised salmon? Probably not, right? So it's kind of one of those right. things where you just look at what is the context. So, and, and that makes sense to me. Now, you're talking about like the actual nutrient profile. Like, like you said, the omega-3s aren't going to be as good. So maybe some of those other components. Is there truth to your knowledge that they are actually bad? Like, I, for, reason, for some reason, tilapia is always the one I, I hear people talk about. And I, the reason I'm, I'm asking again is because a lot of the people who are listening they are somebody who's like, okay, I want some cheap protein sources. And, you know, I think Alaskan salmon, it can be like $15 a pound versus yeah. tilapia is like the cheapest fish I see. And it's actually, it's easy to get it down. Um, as far as like when people talk about like the feed, how they're, they're like just kind of swimming in their own crap all the time. And, and like, do you know yeah. anything about that as far as it actually being a negative, not just kind of like an empty protein source, but an actual negative? Um... I would say I don't know enough about that specific topic to comment, you know, whether it's, it's an actual negative. Um, but I do think that, you know, farming practices of how we raise animals and the food we consume, I think definitely does affect the quality of the food we consume. Um, and I do think, you know, the, the chemicals that are in the water, um, some of that's been transported into us. I think there are some things to consider what the exact effect of those is long-term and how that relates to everything else, um, I think are things that people should, you know, take with a grain of salt, but I think there's bigger fish to fry. Um, just, yeah. You know, pun not intended. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because I, and I'm probably more middle ground there where I think you would maybe have some people who say, hey, we, we don't have any, you know, hard studies to say that it's a problem. You know, these people are whack jobs and then, the supposed whack jobs are saying like, this is so horrible for you. You need to only eat fresh caught and everything is polluted nowadays and you have to raise your own fish or, you know, like some like crazy thing. Um, I, I think it, it's probably reasonable to think kind of like you said, you know, I, I highly doubt that a, a farm raised tilapia or salmon or whatever is 
is nearly as good for you as a f- fresh, like wild caught Alaskan salmon. Um, but at least to my knowledge, I, I don't know if we have like hard evidence showing like how those differences manifest, you know, in certainly not in like body composition, but even in terms of long-term health, I don't, I don't know if that data is out there. Yeah. And I don't think we will ever have good data on that um, because I think those effects are pretty small in terms of like large populations of people. I think where you do find evidence of that is in like weird case studies of people who get, you know, mercury poisoning or some sort of pesticide poisoning from a batch of fish where the water was contaminated. Um, And and those are good lessons of things to learn and things to look out for. Um, And a lot of times what we see is where those become problems and is when people become, um, you know, overly habitual about foods they eat, right? So if you're only eating, you know, uh, farm-raised tilapia for your protein six days a week, I mean, you maybe should consider adding other protein sources in, right? Or maybe, you know, you have the farm-raised tilapia for two meals a week and then you get some, you know, some fresh-caught salmon for one meal because you can afford that. Or you opt for, you know, uh, whatever cut of beef is on sale or some, some you know, uh, range raised chicken. So it's a lot of times where we see these big issues come into play is when people are just consuming a lot of the same thing over and over. Right, for sure. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit, this is something I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I'm definitely out of my wheelhouse and, and that is talking about cancer as a metabolic disease. Um, so like I said, it's definitely switching gears a little bit. I've heard some people talk about this. Um, one of the people I've had on my podcast actually wanted me to donate. I think it's Tom, Tom something, um, Seafried, I guess yes. does research in this area. Um, this is one of like most of the topics I talk about on here, I can kind of get an idea of like, okay, like this, this sounds in line with everything I've heard and what the research is this, I'm, you know, for anybody listening, it's out of my wheelhouse. So I really don't know. Um, so I'm going to be trusting the fact that you were definitely evidence-based here. So, um, kind of just starting off, you know, what is, what is that area of research? Are people looking at it to say, this is purely a metabolic disease? Some cancers are just a metabolic disease. We can treat it with diet. Um, I know that's very broad, but if you can kind of touch on it. Yeah, so I think the, the first place to start is I think people need to have a better understanding of what exactly cancer is, right? Um, and that's a, it's a broad term that's used to define pretty much neoplastic growth in the human body, right? So anything that grows, for lack of a better word, outside of normal regulation and control. Um, and so that describes a whole lot of different processes, right? So, and, though, and so then anytime you assume something that's that broad has a singular um, underlying cause that's very clearly defined, probably needs to maybe reevaluate how they're looking at the problem, right? It's kind of like we don't say, you know, di- all disease stems from the same cause. It's like, no, you know, even metabolic diseases can have all sorts of different causes, right? So, so cancer, I think that's the first piece. Now, the second piece is whether it's this idea of cancer as a metabolic disease is not new. Um, but the guy you mentioned, Thomas Safery, he wrote a book that was published, oh, 2012, 2010, something like that. And he basically went through some of the cancer literature and suggested that instead of cancer being a disease where you have a genetic mutation, and that then causes all these abnormalities, it starts as a metabolic disorder that then causes genetic mutations that then revert back into what we know as cancer. Um, But what what we know is that cancer can be caused from a whole lot of different things, right? We know it can be caused by direct environmental changes to genetic material, right? Um, Smoking, that's exactly what it does. Um, radiation. That's exactly what it does. Um, you know, all those things cause direct genetic mutations that then lead to cancers. Uh, we also know that there are um, viruses that change genomes that cause cancer, right? So we know that it's genetic. Um, we also have some evidence to suggest that metabolic changes can kind of retrofit a genome to cause, you know, cancers like phenotypes or even, or even cancer. So it's, it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. Um, now that being said, even though that 
there can be some metabolic disturbances associated with cancer and maybe even metabolic disturbances that cause cancer. We don't have any evidence to date in humans that a nutrition therapy only is a valid cure for any type of cancer. Um, we have human trials. None of them have shown robust effects over broad ranges of cancer, broad ranges of stages of the same cancer, or even the exact same stage of the exact same cancer. So as, it's, as a standalone therapy, there's no evidence that it's a kind of a, a quote-unquote cure for cancer that we currently know. And, and just briefly, um, when you say like dietary therapies or nutrition therapies, is there like a uniform one they're applying to all these? Or are you talking about there's many different nutrition strategies they've tried? So they've tried a lot of different ones, right? Okay. Um, there's been, well, obviously, the most popular one currently is kind of ketogenic diets for cancer. Right. Um, that is a standalone therapy, has not, you know, cured anything. Um, there for a while was, you know, high dose vitamin C trials. There's been, you know, all high antioxidant therapy. There's been all sorts of stuff, right, that have been kind of dietary interventions. Now, mm -hmm. there is some evidence to suggest that some dietary manipulation may be an adjuvant therapy for cancer, right? So when you take standard of care treatment and you add on maybe targeted nutritional therapy, there may be some benefit. Um, and those are ongoing trials. And the data there is not entirely clear to me yet. Um, there have been some patients who have been reported in case studies as showing some benefit. Um, there have been patients who've reported, you know, it's, it's made it much worse. But we don't really have a clear handle on exactly how they may be beneficial in addition to other therapies. So it's, it's very much still a, an unquantified aspect surrounding most cancers. Um, one of the things that I think is important to remember is one of the biggest risk factors for many types of cancer is, is cachexia, right? So people who just don't get enough food, they don't get enough, you know, energy that their body can kind of sustain what the medical therapy they're going through, right? So a lot of these protocols that are like, you know, don't eat fast, put your body in states of, you know, whatever, need to be kind of handled with a little bit of caution. Right. It's interesting because, I mean, certainly in dental school, certainly in medical school, you, you do learn about cancer, but you learn of it. You know, you have like a pathology class, oral pathology class. You get like a brief introduction, but unless you go into oncology, I mean, you're not really getting in depth about it. Um, I mean, even as, as like a primary care physician, you know, my friends who are PCPs, like they they know like a surface level of it, you kind of get enough knowledge to know that there's a problem and who you have to refer to, right? Um, and that's, and which is good. I mean, you should know when you need to refer mm -hmm. rather than, you know, taking uh, more than you really understand. But it's interesting. So when you talk about this, you said that there has been some evidence that it helps as an adjuvant therapy. What have we seen with that? Like, are we, are we just seeing a, a faster or sorry, a slower progression or what are we finding? Yeah, so typically, and, and I haven't read the most recent trials just because it's been a while since I've looked, but any of the evidence that shows a benefit has basically said it increases your survival rate by like your five year or it extends your, what's the best word I'm looking for? It basically extends your lifespan by a very small amount of time, right? We're talking in the order of weeks, maybe months. Um, mm. It's not like, hey, that you know, it went from a a ten percent remission rate to a sixty percent remission rate, or the you know the survival time went from four years to ten years. It's like, okay, maybe it went from forty six months to forty seven months. Like these are the effect sizes we're talking about. I don't; those aren't exact numbers, but that's sure. roughly about the effect that we're seeing in some of these these beneficial therapies. Is part of that potentially then, I mean, you could, I, I would imagine you could look at most diseases. Like if somebody has, let's say, a cardiomyopathy, if they are improving their diet, you know, like obviously if you have something like um, atherosclerosis, then diet is going to be a big factor in that. But you might have a cardiomyopathy that's, that's unrelated to how your diet's been. I could still see extending one's lifespan through changes in their diet just due to being generally healthier. 
Um, so when we find something like you're just talking in an order of maybe weeks or a couple months, is it possible that it's not having any effect on the cancer itself? It's just allowing they, they have a more robust, uh, you know, body. And so they, I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to tease out which one is which. If you have a healthier body that's able to slightly you know, more effectively fight the cancer, that is helping the cancer. I guess, I don't know if my point is coming across. Yeah, well that's, that's one of those really hard things that's, it's really hard to tease apart, right? Is, okay, what is, here's the intervention. How much of the effect is due to a specific effect of the intervention versus some of these corollary effects that come from an intervention, right? Right. Is there a placebo effect? Is there a, these people maybe are eating a little bit better, they feel a little bit better, they sleep a little bit better, et cetera, right? So those, those effects are really hard to tease out. For sure. Um, so people don't, <laughs> don't just count on your diet if you have cancer. Please see a doctor. Yes. So something that I, I kind of have asked a few people now is based on trends that we've seen in the like, quote unquote fitness industry. And it's kind of interesting talking to so many people over the last year because I've, I've been, I think we're on, man, I, th I think we're like 60 something as far as podcasts. So it's been, it's been a lot. And the fitness industry is very broad and, and some people would say not really consider themselves in the fitness industry. Some people are clearly like very involved in it and some people are more on like the outskirts. Um, and I do talk to people about health in general as well, not just fitness. Have you seen any surprising trends in the last year or two compared? I mean, you know, let's say since we've last talked, has there been anything where it's just kind of like, you know, it's just odd to you that like this is kind of coming out in the industry? Um, I think at this point, nothing surprises me because I've seen so much. <laughs> right, um, right. You know, one of the things, I guess there's, there's, there's things that have surprised me in good ways and bad ways. Um, you know, one of the things that has surprised me in, in the bad ways is we're starting to adopt more and more ex extreme options, right? So we've kind of gone through this phase of Hey, like low carb is an option. Cool. Uh, keto is an option. That's a little more extreme, but okay. And then we have like, hey, it's there's a carnivore diet where it's you don't eat anything but you know high fat, high protein. Um, right. You have things like you know the snake diet that are they combine these really extreme fasting protocols with like you know psychological abuse, and you just start to see these really <laughs> like extreme endeavors that people are going to for for weight loss purposes, right? Um, and I've been a little bit surprised to see the levels of extreme that we see starting to be fairly mainstream. Um, that's been surprising. On the other side, I've also started to see kind of a, a, a group of people starting to kind of lead the way of trying to bring the industry up to a different level. Um, and so that's been really cool to see, you know, seeing a lot of professional people who really care about their craft, uh, you know, starting to legitimize a lot of what we do and kind of reinventing the role that kind of the health and fitness industry has in the overall health profile of, of our, our society, right? So we're kind of going from, you know, this, this approach of like, hey, it's an industry that kind of targets people's, you know, vanity, physical performance, you know, kind of a, a subculture to, you know, we're probably a decade away from being the people on the front lines of healthcare um, because mm -hmm. we have a healthcare system that can't handle the issues and is not designed to handle the issues that we right. have, or should they be responsible for handling those issues? Right? It's not a it's not a general physician's or a oncologist or a orthopedic surgeon or any of these people's jobs to do a lot of the, the coaching and the work that needs to be done with people. Right? It's it's our type of professional that that's who the work needs to do. And we're starting to kind of grow up as an industry and realize that's the, that's the torch we're going to be carrying. So that's yeah. kind of cool to see. Yeah, no, and I think that's a really great point. Um, it, it's funny because <laughs> I was like, talking to one of my assistants today and I was saying, you know, if like how a lot of my patients, you know, you'll see things and you're just like, man, like how did this person not just take care of that? If you look at like medicine, if people would just exercise and diet like it sounds so basic but like such a drastic amount of healthcare is just like the, the expenses are from people not taking care of themselves and if people really like, and i know it sounds so basic but if people you know had their nutrition down had their 
exercise, had their sleep down, things like that, so much, so many of those problems would go away. So I, I kind of like how you said that you really are like the first line defense there. And hopefully they don't get to the point of then having to see their doctor and then seeing a specialist and more specialists until there's nothing that you can really do for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And typically, you know, when you think about internal medicine is outside of, you know, kind of the acute medical crisis, most of those people shouldn't be seeing, you know, the types of patients they are, um, mm -hmm. right? Like the fact that we have nephrology clinics so backed up that you can't get in to see a nephrologist for nine months um, yeah. when you have, you know, diabe diabetic kidney disease is, is kind of a big shock to what the scope of the issues that we're facing are. Right, for sure. Um, so, I'm, you know, a lot of broad topics today. I'm glad we got to do this. I know you're not like super big on social media, uh, but where could people find more of your work? We obviously, if anybody has not seen part one of this, you know, they should check out the podcast from last year. But where is more of your information? Yeah, you can uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Um, you can you can kind of find me at the website that I do all of my coaching through. Um, so we have a company called Macros Inc. Uh, where we do one on one nutrition coaching with kind of uh, you know basically the the general population weight loss client um, is kind of who we're geared towards. Um, and so I, I co own and run that company. Um, and yeah, so you can, you can find me there. I write for, man, just about everybody you can imagine in the industry. My articles are published on. So if you just, if you just type my name in Google, it'll also show up. Very cool, dude. And, and yeah, I think um, I've talked to a couple people about this where, you know, you said you work with like general population. And as much as I love the fitness stuff, in terms of like impacting people's lives, I really feel like the general population is, is kind of where it's at, you know? I mean, as, as awesome as it is to get somebody to see their abs or grow an inch on their arms or something like that, when you have somebody who is like 50 pounds overweight and their blood work looks like crap and all of that, and you can change that, I think that's a very rewarding thing to be doing. Yeah, and you know, that's kind of the mission that I have is how much of a dent can we make in the... The, I don't want to say the issues, but the current state we're in, you know, the health state of our entire society is how can we shift that, that inertia, right? Can we slow it down and can we reverse it? And that's kind of what my goal is. Very cool, man. Well, thank you again for talking. Yeah, appreciate your time. It was good to see you. That's where I'll cut.